hello. My name is Gina Fisasel, uh, she, her. I am the resident dramaturg and the coordinator of EDI work and anti-racist work at People's Light, which is located in Malvern, Pennsylvania, which is also the land, uh, the unceded land of Lena Lenape, which is even among indigenous tribes that the Lena Lenape are known as the grandfathers, which speaks to both their cultural longevity and also their role as mediators and story keepers just among native tribes in this area. So uh, thank you for the land. And also I just wanted to put out there that we are recording this in January of 2021, which, and this conversation will also be released with Zanya's piece that doesn't come until April. So we're also having this conversation before the piece is real is kind of gets its work. And we're talking like pre-script right now. We have like big, beautiful ideas. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there that we're just that the context and the time in the timeline of this conversation. We'll be talking about this project about spiritual uprising for sure. Uh, but also to give some I would love to just get some context for spirituals um, and to talk about the intersection of, of these songs and storytelling in general, how they're both embedded and then being used to tell stories in this case, uh, and to get more into what it means to reimagine within this genre as well. I also want to take the time to acknowledge that I am, I do not identify as Black or African American. Um, I want to acknowledge that this genre is so embedded in just the great wound of our nation uh, from slavery to the continuing dehumanization of Black Americans, and that we're talking about a tool that comes out of the African diaspora and was used to just validate Black lives from the beginning. Uh, so I want to thank you for allowing me uh, into this space and into this conversation uh, and for being willing to share so much of that, so much of what's in your DNA, so much of what's your in, in your ancestry in this public kind of forum. And to thank you for um, just your survival and your wisdom and uh, just your radical generosity here that I don't take for granted. So, uh, so thank you for that. And with that, I, I want to introduce this rock star panel for people watching. Get ready, here we go. So first, I'm going to do some bragging because I, I was going to leave it to you all, but you won't. You'll be like, yeah, I'm a singer. I'll be like, oh, no, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so first up, so creator, just cure every like just visionary of this piece itself, Sonia Love who is an amazing, amazing vocalist, like blow the roof off of wherever she is vocalist. Uh, she's performed in theaters across the country and internationally, including, you know, this little place that we all know called Broadway uh, in the cult at a little show we also know as The Color Purple as part of the original, um, ver like the original production of that. And also was on the national tour of the Tony Award winning musical Avenue Q. She's also sung at this little venue called Carnegie Hall uh, and in state uh, on stages in Lyons and Liverpool and Scotland and St. Martin's and Toronto. And, um, and then there's also a little space called People's Light <laughs> in a play called Lights Out, uh, which is the story of Nat King, uh, Nat King Cole in the last night of his network show. She's a member of Broadway Inspired Voices, which recorded with the band the Yeah, Yeah, Yes, and performed with Mariah Carey, uh, and provided background vocals for TV shows like America's Got Talent, Smash, David Letterman Show. Um, but she also, as all of us here, um, offers voice and service and offers talent in service. Um, you know, at volunteering at Ronald McDonald House, Broadway Cares, Equity Fights Age, AIDS, and the Covenant House, um, and is a is a member of Bold, E O L D, uh, which was an organization established in 2015 uh, that supports and uplifts Black women in the entertainment industry. So, hello, Zania. So, I'm going to ask people to just like share uh, just names, pronouns, and where they're zooming in from. Yes. Zanya Love, she, her. I am here on the land of the Muncie Lenape. Thank you so much for this uh, this uh, this land. Thank you 
Thank you, ancestors. Thank you, spirits. Um, and I'm in Washington Heights. Great. So next one, if you're not already geeking out, we, there's still more on this panel. One being Mr. Arian Harley Emerson. He is currently the director uh, of music and operations at the Choir School of Delaware. And he grew up singing in church choirs and conservatory choirs from a very young age. I think it's, I read that you were in a conservatory choir from the age of seven. Um, so young. So, and also sang with symphony orchestras and opera companies um, and have just degrees and experience, bachelor's degree in music theory and composition and vocal performance, uh, specifically opera. I also studied piano and conducting master's degrees in choral conducting and vocal performance from the University of Delaware School of Music. Uh, conducted also at this little kind of church called St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican City. And also another kind of place that we might all know about called the Kimmel Center in Philadelphia um, and Joseph Meyerhold Symphony Hall in Baltimore. So coming from growing up, uh, born and raised in Baltimore, uh, it published articles, given these little things called TED Talks, uh, and then also consults arts organizations on equity, diversity, inclusion, belonging, and anti-racism as well um, in terms of his service uh, to the work and his vision. Um, and also currently serves as the national chair of the American Choral Directors Association's Diversity Initiatives Committee among other amazing things. So welcome, Arian. So happy to be here. Again, Arian, he is uh, um, really excited. I'm, I'm zooming in today um, from Wilmington, Delaware, my office here at the choir school, though um, I am, uh, I do live over the line in PA, um, where uh, it's in the Susquehannock uh, area. So again, thank you for that land and just excited for a great uh, and robust conversation. Thank you. Uh, and then next on this illustrious list is Mr. Steve Broadnax, who is, I don't know what he's not really. Um, so, uh, but I'll name, I mean, I'm, I first met him as a director, but, uh, and he's directed all over the, you honestly look at, it's, it's like a where's where, who's who, like of people that he's worked with, of where he's directed, like the biggest regional countries in the theater with some of the biggest contemporary playwrights of this time, um, including like, you know, Dominique Mariso, Katori Hall, and also like directing, a, and again, on this little space we all know called Broadway, <laughs> upcoming uh, Thoughts of a Colored Man by Keenan Scott II, upcoming. Come on, Broadway, here we go. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, I haven't seen it, but I would love to see Steve as actor. He's also an actor, been uh, actor performer, also toured nationally and internationally. Um, and mainly, I mean, just so generously wonderful as an educator and a mentor, uh, as a tenured professor at Penn State and the head of the MFA acting program uh, and the associate director of the Pennsylvania Center Stage at Penn State as well. And in this capacity here, he's also a writer, <laughs> you know, like plays, solo shows, uh, a little short film called 2020 Vision, uh, which people's like uh, commissioned recently, which was this response uh, to the wave and shouts, you know, again, attesting to the full humanity of Black lives. And um, also is one of People's Light's commission new play Frontiers writers, which I'll explain a bit later, uh, in a play called Bayard Rustin, Inside Ashland, which talks, which, you know, with Martin Luther King um, kind of a day coming up too, I feel like Bayard should also be an equally household name. But we'll talk about that and set that up when we kind of bring that into the conversation. Also as a songwriter and a musician, see, again, like what is, what is he not? Uh, and on that 2020 vision, I don't know if people have seen that as well, but you got a little bit of Steve in his oh. like hip hop performance as well. <laughs> I think I screamed a little when I heard that. So welcome, Steve. Hello, everybody. Steve Brodnick, he, him, his. I am currently in State College, Pennsylvania, in my home office, Arion. Uh, that's where I am. Your office is classy. <laughs> I, this book, 
this looks more classier than it really is. Ain't nothing but a curtain behind me and a house window. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, <laughs> but I am happy to be here. And also the resident director at People's Light, Gina. Yes. And my yes. new position with her. So I'm excited to be an honor to be invited to this conversation. Thank you. Yes, yes. Oh, we're oh, so and excited. I can't draw. That is something I cannot do. Yes. I, visual art. I'm drawing a stick man, though. A stick man? <laughs> I don't know. We say things, you say things like that. It's just like beyond yesterday. It's like, I don't know. I really can't play organ. I'm, and I'm still just like, I don't know. I think <laughs> you put her in front of an organ. I think she could probably tear it up still. Your stick man will probably be doing something like totally awesome anyway. So, but speaking of Dion, hello, Dion. Dion is an award winning. I also and everything like these are just this is renaissance people um that are gathered here award-winning composer and lyricist and arranger of choral pieces and original musical theater pieces and uh Deanne is a choral and music director in churches and for theater musicals um also has performed in little places that we know called you know joe joe's pub by the public off broadway um, little place called the New, Ho New York Philharmonic, uh, worked, worked a little there, um, and has just appeared on numerous, numerous, numerous national and international stages. Also a singer, also a teaching artist, uh, also, as I learned yesterday, just, I mean, a wonderful artist and advocate uh, for Black voices and representation in this conversation in this genre, um, especially the musical voice that's rooted in Black sacred music. So hello, Dion, welcome. Hi, I'm, I'm so glad to be here. I'm, I'm Dion, she, her, hers. Um, I am coming to you from Brooklyn, New York, um, Lenape land. Um, blessings to those who've gone before me, who've made it possible for me to be here. Um, especially those who make it possible for me to be all that I am and, and do what I do. Um, I don't take it lightly, um, even as light as my heart may be as I do it. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited um, about this music. Um, and it is true, even though I am a, I, I am a gospel musician, the Hammond organ is not one of my gifts. I did not get that ministry. I acknowledge that, but I got a lot of life in front of me, so things could be different. And, yeah. You know, at some point in the future, I just wanted to put that out there. We'll see. I don't know. I think it's just to me, maybe. <laughs> like the average, the average person in the world. You're all geniuses. So. Let's begin at the beginning. I think it's just you know what what is rooting us here in this conversation with spiritual uprisings, uh, you know, by created, crafted, uh, kind of burst from the forehead of Zanya Love. So Zanya, can you tell us a little bit about your personal journey and exposure to spirituals, um, and then about this project and where it came from? Absolutely. Um, so I grew up singing in the church. Um, Pentecostal, apostolic, stump clapping, stumping, clapping, shouting, speaking in tongues, all that. And I was in church from Sunday until Sunday. <laughs> Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Not all day Sunday. No, I mean, a whole, basically every day had an assignment at the church. And so I spent much of my life there. And um, although... Although I don't recall us singing from hymnals a lot, I was still in touch with um, a lot of the spirituals um, because of uh, where I was um, at school in South Carolina. We were still learning uh, Negro spirituals in school versus other schools that had moved on to what everyone else, like, you know, what was popular. Um, and so I was singing uh, choral music um, and also Precious Lord is like my mom's favorite song. Uh, and so just hearing it throughout the house and, and I grew up, you know, my dad was a preacher and we weren't allowed to listen to any secular music. So gospel music was always in my house, always playing in my house. And again, when I wasn't home, I was in church. So I was um, 
rooted in it. Um, and then I would say around about um, high school, lost touch with it, meaning I wasn't had, I didn't take any classes or it, it wasn't in my uh, choir, wasn't in our, our uh, repertoire. And so I kind of missed out on what was happening on in that scene, the, the Negro spirituals. Um, and then I went to uh, the fabulous HBCU, North Carolina A&T State University, Aggie Pride, um, where I was just, <laughs> yes, you know about it, um, where our gospel choir, um, award-winning uh, gospel choir, uh, sung some um, Negro spirituals. So always been like exposed to it, but not really deep diving in it. And then in 2000, and so coming to, um, how Spiritual Uprising came about um, in 2015, I was doing a show at the Guthrie um, about the Freedom Riders called The Parchment Hour, um, directed by Patricia McGregor, um, who directed Lights Out. Um, and, uh, and there were lots of labor songs and Negro spirituals. And I'm like, I, I, was, I was saying to myself, now I know this one, but there's like eight, nine, ten a lot of songs that I don't know, I've never heard. And so, because, you know, for me as a performer, I like to research um, the time period. So, um, you know, Negro spirituals were used heavily during the um, Freedom Rise, during the Civil Rights era. Um, and I'll get, get to that, uh, I'll come back to that. But I had to do the research for the time period, the songs that were being sung, and then I, I, the catalog was extensive and I was like, I feel like these are my birthrights and they were taken from me. Um, and so I, I, it was at that time that I was like, I wanna, I wanna learn more or I wanna do more with the Negro spirituals. And then I just kind of like went on about my life and you know, as a performer, you kind of get caught up in doing everybody else's project. And then in 20, 19, I did a show about the Fifth Jubilee Singers in DC. And I was engulfed in the Fifth Jubilee Singers. And I was disappointed that I didn't have more knowledge of them. And I felt like, you know, if I have the little knowledge that I have and I feel like I haven't really heard about the Fist Jubilee Singers, what are other people, um, how are how are other people being kept from this information? And I know, you know, that our educational system doesn't, doesn't do a good job of highlighting the accomplishments and the contributions of, of black people. Um, and so I, I, you know, attribute it to that and then also just wanting to like wanting to be current with whatever music is current and so the history of it is um is is lost was lost on me until that time um and so after um doing uh jubilee that's the name of the show at the um in that i did in dc I was, I was, I was charged. I was like, okay, so I had, I had a couple of ideas that I had <laughs> recorded on my voice notes. I was like, okay, it's time to flesh these out. It's time to do, do these. Um, and so I was just going to do an album. And so I've been like kind of working on it, but again, you know, you work with other people you, for other people's projects and you kind of put yourself stuff to the side. And <laughs> during the pandemic, um, I reached out to Zach about, um, about something else. And he was like, so what are you working on? And I was like, well, you know, I've been working on this, this album, this uh, Negro Spirituals Reimagined. He was like, tell me more. And so from there, we um, um, decided that Spiritual Uprising um, would be a concert that I, I would uh, present. And so I was commissioned to write um, the show, which is, it's a concert with some speaking um but it's mostly music um so i had to put myself first and flesh this flesh this music out flesh these songs out flesh the story out that i want to tell the journey that i want to tell um and so that's how it came about that was a really long answer but hopefully all the details are there <laughs> 
No, it's great. And you do have an example of kind of, you know, just your musicality also already kind of up on our website, you know, with Suna will be done with the troubles. So, I mean, there's, there's something that, you know, knowing the songs is one thing, but then adding your own kind of this, this urge to kind of add your own, like kind of take or spin, you know, the idea of reimagining um, these, I think is going to be really exciting. I'm so excited for to here what those well, my, are goal, my goal is to my goal is to attract uh more people young people to it and and sometimes people have a barrier mm -hmm. um with their music education you know they have a limited um some people um and I, I just find that um it's a way to bridge the gap um hopefully for people who haven't been exposed to it at all my hope is that they'll hear let's say soon I will be done my version and say, oh, this isn't the original. This is a cover. Let me go listen to the original. Mm -hmm. And then their mind is blown by what they're exposed to um, from the original, from well, what we consider the original um, because mm -hmm. we don't know who originally <laughs> um, sang each song. So that's my hope. That's my goal. Fingers crossed that it works. Yeah. I mean, speaking about just that context and that lack of knowledge and, you know, offering, I think, Ariane, that's been your thing about, you know, offering context to these songs and performance, which you do offer to a range of ages from, you know, elementary school all the way to, you know, seniors in high school to senior citizens <laughs> and, you know, offering context for these uh, for the uninitiated in this genre is part of, you know, um, your mission. So I don't know if you can can you offer some context in addition to maybe your own personal journey yeah. um, into this genre, but offer some context for spirituals for those of us that don't know much? Sure. Um, you know, my story and my background is similar to Zanya's when she was like, we were at church from Sunday to Sunday. It's a true thing. <laughs> Sunday was church and it was all day and Monday was youth choir and Tuesday was Bible study and Wednesday was church choir and Thursday was men's choir. Friday, you might have that one off. Saturday was men's prayer breakfast, you know? And so like, it literally was Sunday to Sunday. And that really was the experience that I had when I was growing up and it was rich and it was rich. Um, so, you know, that's pretty much where I came uh, from, that kind of church experience. And then um, I was identified um, as, you know, being musical as a child. So I got picked up um, and uh, had this conservatory experience at Peabody uh, Conservatory um, in Baltimore. And then that was a completely different type of musical education. So from I, I was living one life at church and living another life when I was um, at the conservatory. And it was very much so that I was uh, learning these two things and not really understanding the cross between these and what I could do with them. I, they, I felt like I had split personality disorder. I didn't understand what was really happening. And I remember even um, saying, doing things like, uh, you know, singing a spiritual or a piece of gospel and saying, oh, I'm going to sing that Peabody style, meaning I'm going to sing it in this classical style, because I did not understand really the difference between like the genres, how the vocal production, the pedagogy between uh, the differences between these um, kinds of things. So it really wasn't until I was much older and in high school uh, that it began to make sense to me that like, oh, this is what this is. And then I became very much so interested in it. I kept reading books. I kept listening to recordings. I kept, I just was hungry to, to understand um, what this was and to, um, you know, I remember the first time I realized that some of these songs we were singing in church were in a book and that book was the hymnal. But like, let me tell you, it was just crazy when I began to like sit at the piano and play through these and understand them from like a, a theoretical perspective. And then it was really in college when I began to um, understand um, you know, what the historical significance of this was. So for our friends um, who might be watching, um, just to kind of establish a little bit about what the spirituals are, they are the first original music from the United States. And I like to always, um, uh, you know, mention that, like it is the only, it was the original music that was birthed on these shores that came from 
the United States. But I am so appreciative of those who continue to call these Negro spirituals because I think it pays homage to the, the struggle of those who were enslaved. Now, we don't call them slaves. We say they were enslaved, right? Because uh, this was not a choice. And so the Negro spirituals are still called Negro spirituals in a lot of uh, circles because the persons who were singing them, those who were enslaved, our ancestors, did not have the rights um, of white Americans. And as such, you know, I think it's important that we remember to call it uh, um, Negro spirituals or even the Negro national anthem lift every voice and sing. I like to refer to it as that because there was a lot of struggle that went into that. And that goes into the context of these pieces. So these spirituals, um, you have to remember that Christianity was not the religion of these folks. However, these were the stories that the, the enslaved Africans heard. And so they began to hear these in church services. They began to, um, it became part of spiritual life um, of our ancestors. And then, um, you know, people began to sing because they're singing in every culture, right? There was singing in Africa and that singing came over and that tradition of call and response was part of it. So there would always be someone who would be leading the, the song, the call, and then everyone would sing in response. And that's how these were um, taught. And so these were taught, remember, you have to think about it as um, apps running in the background, right? Because it was functional music. By functional music, what we mean by that is it was used for a purpose. So whether that was church or work, right? And so uh, when I hear arrangements of spirituals, I always love to hear uh, the kind of work quality of it. It sounds gritty um, and it ain't a spiritual unless it sounds like you've been through it. Right, because that is actually where these come from, and so um, that's really the history of them. Uh, we, uh, you know, have spirituals that uh, are very complex because they are religious in nature. However, they also have hidden symbols about the Underground Railroad. Uh, there are real people who these are attributed to, like Harriet Tubman, um, you know, who is particularly known for wading the water. We know that spirituals were then used to navigate the Underground Railroad to know who was a safe person to go to. And that's why the text of those spirituals change from place to place. And that, um, you know, really after the time of enslavement and after the Civil War and, you know, uh, Reconstruction, they kind of went away for a long, 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 long time. And it wasn't until the 1900s that we began to uh, uh, rediscover the spirituals and folks like Burley uh, began to write these down and William Dawson began to write these things down uh, because they were trained musicians. And then, yeah, the Jubilee Singers really brought them back because they were the first ones to do what we call the concert spiritual, meaning complex, written down arrangements of spirituals that were gonna be done the same time, every time. Because you have to remember there was an in improvisatory style with the spiritual. And so what made Fisk and the Jubilee singers were like, this is the arrangement, it's written down, this is how we do it, and we're gonna go tour with it. And so the Fisk Jubilee singers are really credited to really bringing uh, the spiritual back into our consciousness. So that's, um, you, know, um, you know, this is like a, a whole course, a college course here um, in a few minutes of, uh, of the spiritual. Um, and so I think it's something that we should all be excited about. Um, we should look at as a time capsule. Yeah, I was so excited in our conversation we had um, a couple of weeks ago when you were we were both so excited about just the regional nature of these songs as well, and that we are in, I mean, such a rich area to have have these conversations actually. Um, and then you know one of the resources that you had mentioned earlier um, was tracking the regional differences and how it changed, especially you know as slaves or enslaved people were. Thank you for that. Um, you know, escaping to the north, that the functions of the songs would then change. Yes. So but that we are in a more right at Mason Dixon line, so that there were people on both sides, almost having a conversation through these through these songs. So uh, that the history of the spirituals this isn't necessary. You know, it's it is our national history, but in, especially in this region. I think it's our own kind of like context 
of how neighborhoods got formed, you know, so. Absolutely, and where we are in this kind of Delaware Valley area, um, like this was the critical part. Like if you were gonna make it, you had to make it north of Philadelphia. And once you were there, you're, the, the, the journey changed completely once you began to get to upstate New York, because you have to remember in the Southern area, this is where their, um, you know, the plantations were in, in, in Maryland, right? And, you know, Pennsylvania was free, right? So there around that line was just like this, wow, like a, a lot of tension that was going on there. And then the South, they were so mad about it that they started sending people to the North to go and find runaway slaves and to also, um, you know, prosecute cases for those who were aiding and abetting those who were enslaved. And so, yeah, it is a very interesting geographic area that we are in because it where we are was probably it, it, it was the most treacherous and dangerous uh, part of the journey and where the spiritual would have been the most useful so that there would have been direction, not only where to go geographically, but to know where was safe and where one could know that they could find um, help from abolitionists or others um, who could guide them to the next stop on the Underground Railroad. Yeah, that this music was just so personal in that way too and like just so functional. Um, to me lends itself to, um, I don't know, <laughs> how, how songs can be contextualized now, especially when telling a story, a certain story about a certain someone named Fired Rustin. Um, so Steve, I'm, I just to set up what New Play Frontiers is and maybe uh, why this, this, how this, how the play about Fire Rustin didn't come about. So New Play Frontiers is a commissioning uh, program from People's Light where we've invited nationally recognized playwrights to the area to explore and just to, you know, see what the, there is to see based on their subjective lenses, um, become interested and dive deeper into questions and to conversations that are happening basically right in our backyard. One of those playwrights was Dominique Mariso, who got incredibly interested in a neighborhood called the uh, Westchester. And, uh, and especially the heart of the Black community in Westchester, and uh, specifically anchored at, the, at a place, community center called the Mountain Center. And Steve Broadnax directed this wonderful production of Mud Row, which was the play that came out of Dominique's investigation. And while Steve was kind of checking out Westchester, you know, kind of came across this figure, you know, by Rustin, which you knew of before, but didn't know that he, you know, is a son of Westchester, like grew up like born and bred in Westchester. Um, and just the history that of of that of Bayard that's so local to us here, um, and Bayard uh, that who is who we often know as you know the mastermind of uh, the 1963 March on Washington, which is just even a funny thing to say in this moment. <laughs> so, uh, but just that of what that of what that was that event was that the massiveness of what that was. Um, but this play, uh, Bayard Rustin Inside Ashland, is about uh, his career before this kind of master um, event that he planned, about his career in, 1940, in the 1940s where he was really testing out strategies of nonviolence while serving in federal prison in Ashland, Kentucky, for resisting the draft as a pacifist. Um, Steve, you've at one point during the development, you know, you called this like, oh, I think I think this is actually like a choral drama in the making. Um, we on to talk about that. When he said that earlier today, I was like, that's what it ended up being that I discovered choral drama, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah, so I was wondering, and there are, um, it's, it's so interesting that the, the crossover in terms of the, the Negro spirituals that are in both Zanya's piece and in your piece, mm -hmm. um, and soon I will be done with the Trolls of the World, which is what opens your play, yes. Steve. So I was wondering, because there is so much narrative and because there's so much history and, you know, there's there's a functional quality to it and necessity and vitality and, you know, to the, to the songs itself and that it's come from, you know, like a tradition that's so deeply culturally tied. Um, how, how then or why were you pulling in spirituals or why was that your impulse to intersect spirituals with Bayard Rustin's story? Um, specifically um, because Bayard Rustin um, has 
two albums of spirituals and Elizabethan songs. So he was a tenor. He was on Broadway with Paul Robeson. I mean, this man's musical career, that's what he was known for, is singing. So that's where the intersection came for me. It was easy when I discovered, because I, I, I mean, I knew he basically is the voice of nonviolence for the civil rights movement. He brought the ideology of nonviolence to Dr. Martin Luther King and that we know and and again he was his chief advisor that that organized the march on Washington which you said but when I discovered that he also was a singer um, out of Westchester and of spirituals and Elizabethan songs that is what I wanted to incorporate um, as was who he was you know what I mean being and then a, a, a man from Westchester that was a Quaker a black man that was a Quaker I mean there were just things that I was like I didn't even know that existed you know what I mean? and and to be same gender loving man out and proud at the time that he was and i identify as same gender loving man and to have a hero and an icon that i knew nothing about um during that time period was where the intersection came in the narrative of of the piece so and zonia created helped me create one of the roles called sister mother um because um he um his mother he grew up believing was his sister because his mother had him at a teenage um age and they were very spiritual and religious so the grandmother just like many grandmas do in the black family took on the child and he was raised to believe that his mother was his sister until he was a teenager and then she said no child that's your mama um we just just that's how it was and they you know kept moving but um Bayard um was a was a singer in spiritual Elizabethan songs so to use those songs and I love that Ariane was talking about um, how the function of which they are used sometimes to capture mood and essence but also as work songs or have a kind of a volition of 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 action like to tell the people in the jail of um of don't let nobody turn you around is one song that we use but it the the jail um the, the men in the jail use it as a way to say for activism to say okay we want everybody to hear our voices in our prison to let you know something getting ready to go down you know what i mean so it's interesting how in the 40s um these songs are used in narratives in this play um but yeah so by arresting yeah, I love like just the expanded kind of function also of the songs yeah. in your yeah. play too, because you guess like, you know, songs as activism, songs as, you know, sometimes I feel like a motherless child when you're just alone in a jail yeah. cell, yeah. you know, and but also like songs that connect, you know, are, are being used to connect. Like Byron is, you know, very begrudgingly offered the opportunity to teach a music class. And, you know, yeah. so you have a song between him and another individual mm -hmm. named Tennessee who, yeah. and they're building relationship through singing, yeah. through we'll song. So it's this, the function of the music, I think, is, is storytelling is relational, but it's also largely social. It's also... Um, emotional so i just feel like that there's a there's like an expansion i think of the use of of spiritual of negro spirituals kind yeah. of just woven uh throughout you know and then and it'll be really interesting you know once it, it'll it, we will be back in the theater at some point it will yeah. premiere at some yeah, point. For sure. but just like the emotional experience of seeing someone that's on hunger strike be force fed and then her and then hearing of a negro spiritual Yep. After that, like what to, to get us through, you know, for him to sustain, you know, his spiritual self is what kept him moving forward. And so spirituals play a really um, um, important vessel to always remember the light, um, the spiritual light, the spiritual um, realism. Of, of what was always, he has foundation that was set back in the church for him to continue to move forward. So yeah, um, yeah. The of it is, is, is really amazing. Yeah, Dion and I were talking about that yesterday, actually, is the song, like the function of the song to, to move through, mm -hmm. not to like avoid or get around or distract, mm -hmm. or but to move through. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and to be unapologetic about that. Um, mm -hmm. And to me, that's so <laughs> both like heartbreaking, but also, I don't know, just confidence inspiring that that's possible in the human just existence in general that there is something that can do that 
<laughs> that can acknowledge your pain and pull you and actually like bring you through. Um, that that is human created. That is self created. It comes like out of us. Um, so so Dion, I'm just wondering more specifically about the music in spiritual uprising. Um, but also in terms of that, like, I think to hear your entry points also into this genre um, and to speak more about just musicality and, and these arrangements and why you're excited about this re these reimaginings that will be presented. Uh, so super quick, um, because I grew up United Methodist and not Pentecostal, although um, in, in my later adult life, I was definitely Baptist Costa Kojic. Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, we only did church on Sundays, but, but, um, I grew up in a church that had seven choirs because we had a lot of kids around. Like we had a couple of hundred kids around at, at any, at any given time. Um, we were not a mega church, um, by any means, but definitely we had, we had the community participation and the membership that made it possible for many, many years to have like three different levels of children's choirs. And then we had what some Protestant churches refer to as a chancel choir mm -hmm. because they sat up in the chancel of the church, which is which in church speak is close to the altar. And so they did all the, the classical things and the anthems. Um, and then we had a couple of ad hoc choirs, which were, you didn't have to be particularly musically literate um, and you didn't sing that often. And those are the women's choirs and the men's choirs. Um, and then we had one gospel choir that you had to at least be in high school in to be able to join. I still don't know why that was, but it worked out that way. Um, so we had seven choirs and I was part of all of them, including the men's choir because I was their accompanist. Mm. Right. And so I also was one of the one of three organists. So so let me be clear about the organ thing. I can play a pipe organ. <laughs> I can play a pipe organ. I can't play. I can't play the Hammond that well. Again, I got time to work on that. Um, but but part of but but um, using the word rich. Right. I, I to borrow from Ariane, I think that is very, very accurate um, because we we did we did hymns. Um, John and Charles Wesley who were brothers who were foundational in the forming of the United Methodist Church, like wrote a ton of hymns that, that are part of the Protestant tradition to this day. We sang hymns, we sang anthems, we sang contemporary Christian things. We did gospel music. Um, and also we had programs. We had a Christmas program. We had a Thanksgiving program. We had an Easter pageant. Um, Christmas pageant, excuse me. We had, we had an Easter pageant. We had a Christmas pageant. We had something for Mother's Day. We had something for Father's Day. We had something for the beginning of the school year. We had something for the ending of the school year, which is generally when we did the secular music. Um, and then we had vacation Bible school. And at the end of vacation Bible school, you had some kind of performance. So like week one of vacation Bible camp, right? You started working on whatever this performance was gonna be. And so for years and years and years of this, plus I had private um, piano lessons and we did a recital every year. And so part of, the, um, of, of my upbringing was this rich, rich, rich experience of learning these things. Like I learned the Hallelujah Chorus when I was 12. And to this day, I can still sing the alto part from memory. Like that was part of my my upbringing, and so absolutely spirituals were were part of that, and and part of that actually from a choral perspective. Um, like I remember very early on listening to the Hall Johnson arrangement, learning the Hall Johnson arrangement of I've Been Viewed, another piece that I could do from memory from this day because it was that, um, because it was that uh, present and powerful. And so I, I went to college and I studied music in college. Um, I studied it from a Eurocentric perspective. Um, but I also got involved in community choirs that were doing gospel music. And so I, I had a chance to dive, to do deep dives into, into that from a musical perspective. And then um, kind of became an accidental musical theater composer where I had just written some songs that I was hoping would be picked up by somebody super famous so that I could make some retirement money, not necessarily be on stage myself, right? Um, but that was my hope. And then, and then from there, like those pieces became part of um, other pieces, and I started writing from that perspective, but everything that underpinned everything that I worked on, even as a musical director on other 
things, right? Because I, because, because I've also music directed other people's work, and I've also um, music directed freestanding things like Beauty and the Beast um, and and Shrek, right? All of that was underpinned by um, the way that I label myself, and that is a practitioner of Black sacred music. Um, and so, what's really exciting about spiritual uprising for me is the chance to to really look at um, a melody as simple as "Soon I Will Be Done with the Troubles of the World" and 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 have um, an Afrobeat feel put to it, and it makes you listen to it in a different way. Um, and, and so, and that's just one thing I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, like drop too many spoilers um, at this, at this point about the arrangements. Right. But, but to, to, to be able to, to do that, to take this, this tissue, um, and, and plant it and plant it in good, rich soil. Right. Um, one of the things from an agricultural perspective, right, since we're talking about the very briefly about the experience of, of, of enslaved Africans was that you couldn't plant the same thing in the same places. Like some parts of, of, of the country, some parts um, that are farmland, like you could, corn would grow in some places, wheat would grow in some places, cotton would grow in some places, fruit would grow in some places, right? And that's about, that's about the seed and that's about the soil. And, and so with this music, right, we have these glorious seeds that we're gonna plant in all kinds of soil. And we're gonna have um, grow these really beautiful plants. Some of it is gonna be tobacco. Some of it is gonna be cotton. Some of it is gonna be flowers. Some of it is gonna be fruit, right? Um, and to have, so to have this opportunity is, is, is really, really um, exciting and, and glorious. Yeah, glorious. I, I like that word, glorious. I think I think that's really really fitting um, as a description. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, just speaking to the diversity, I think of the offerings and what it means, like to you know, thinking of it in the metaphor of a seed is such a wonder, is so helpful and so wonderful um, for what we're going to experience um, come April. So because this genre is so complex, as I'm reading more and more about it, it's you know, there's so much pain but yet it was used to validate the humanity and existence so there's even like joy and comfort actually in in the songs when we talk about musical theater or when we teach about musical theater we say that you want to sing the emotions in a in a moment um and uh as, as much as i i love um make them hear you from from ragtime um i find it uh really ironic that that has become kind of an anthem um, for this moment. Um, but then I remember a song like, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, right? Or um, I've got a robe, you've got a robe, all God's children got a robe, right? That's a, that, and these are, these are spirituals. Like these are, these are songs that I think deserve to be more anthemic than they are, um, and 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 I hope um, not to be like too markety, advertisingy, but I really hope that spiritual uprising, right, becomes a, a flashpoint for really making for really making these songs, for really making spirituals become more of the things that uh, more more um, more present. Mm. more 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 present and and more of the more what we should lean into like really lean into really get it really get into and really grasp um for for inspiration yeah i was talking to i mean in conversation with zanya uh, a couple weeks ago as well um i i have she, she said you know it's where this this music is where the ancestors meet the activists and they're passing on that torch and saying, here you go. And with all of the complexities and almost, you know, um, kind of counterpoints that are held within this, within a song, within this genre, um, I'm, I have the, just this is one of my questions actually is the idea of, of, of the sense of escape, you know, the idea that um, 
you know, sooner we'll be done with the troubles of the world, you know, gone, uh, going home to live with God. But yet there is this um, kind of embedded resistance in that, like to stay, like there's this, there's this tension between wanting to escape but then this tension of of resist of, of staying where you are and resisting and fighting for that humanity, which is so much of I think what's happening, the resistance of today in terms of an anthem for the for the activism, um, I think that's fueling a lot of the conversation today. And and Zanya, I don't know if you want to speak to this idea of of you know what what that tension is and feels like in the song and this music and and the idea of connecting to ancestors that even like or needing that for our activism for today? Yeah. Um, w- one, one thing I wanted to say when Dion was talking is that, unfortunately, we haven't moved beyond the need to sing these songs. So we, we have to look back and, and rely on our ancestors to give us the map, um, to give us the words to say, to give us the direction because we're still looking for that freedom. We're still looking for that role. We're still looking for um, validation as a human being. Um, we we know, you know, as we're recording this, this is the week after um, what happened at the state capitol, and we're looking at we're looking at how white people's lives are more val are more valued. Um, uh, just today or yesterday, I don't remember his name. I don't want to really say it. I, I I don't care to say it. But the, the the guy who carried out the ledger, you know, he was arrested and then now he's out on bond. Who he committed an act, an an unlawful act, and he's out on bond. Whereas a few years ago, Khalif, who c- committed suicide, was held in jail for three years. I think it was three years without a trial, without, there was no, there was no, um, um, conviction. There was no bond. Like it, it blows my mind. We continue, we, we see continually that our lives are not valued in the same way as white people. So we still have to sing this music. And although, yes, we want to get, we want to get to the point beyond this. We will, I got a robe, you got a robe. When I get to heaven, I'm going to put on my robe. Yes, when I get to heaven. But, but I believe as a Christian that God wants us to make heaven here on earth too. I should, I, what's the point? Just send me to heaven. What's the point of being on this earth? If, if I can't make, if I can't enjoy my time, if I can't make it better, you know, as I leave out than it was when I, when I came into this world. And so, yes, we still have to sing these songs. And, you know, I love the quote and I'm going to but- butcher it, but you know how Nina Simone says, you know, it's the artist's duty to reflect the time in which they live in. And we are still living in a time where we have to fight for our humanity. And so these, these lyrics, these songs, these experiences, as they are or were our ancestors, they are also ours and they'll continue to be ours. Um, so yeah, it, yeah, that's mm. getting a little. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, I mean, I, that these songs are still so necessary. It speaks to the, again, like just the absolute, like kind of like horror of the function of these songs as well that we could still lean on them um i mean arian when we were talking you had said that what the spiritual did i love this was was to put musical resistance on the map that it that it was you know when we're talking about especially the civil rights movement too um that song was integral to resistance in a way that you know, wasn't necessarily part of the American Revolution. That this music is it has resistance baked yeah. into it. And I always um, like to mention. I mean, there's definitely music and cultures, and there have, certainly there were some songs in the Revolution for sure, and and things like that. However, um, it is the spirituals that really began a significant a significant change in the way that music was used in activism. We see that in the civil rights movement. We see that in apartheid South Africa. We see that all throughout Central and South America. There is no doubt uh, that certainly this idea of resistance through song um, is really core to 
um, and, and can be and traced to to the Negro spiritual. And you know, I one thing that has me kind of just like you know thinking and, and reflecting right now is like yeah, as much as much as there was resistance, there was also an escaping. There was also rootedness, and I'm going to stay and see this see this through because there are family there there are my family is here and and is not going to make that journey as well so just a, 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 a complex and then here's the other thing i like to let people know is that not every spiritual is a tragedy and that's the thing that makes the genre so incredible because it speaks to a people who are bent but not broken and i think that so there there are so many songs of great joy um that are uh, born from this period of enslavement and so much struggle and and i think that's uh something that we can continually learn from is finding the joy in those situations and i think it's because you know you know, those who were enslaved were able to still find joy in family. They were still able to find joy in community. They were still able to find joy in spirituality and God. And that to me is, is incredible. It's, it's incredible. It is absolutely incredible. And the fact that there are, were so many who were enslaved who decided they were not going to run, not for fear of being caught, but for fear of not being in community with their people. And, you know, mm -hmm. that is something that, you know, I think is also just incredibly profound uh, and really just something that we should allow to continue to, to resonate with us. And one of the things that... Um, you know, that I was really also appreciative of that, you know, Dion, you were, were talking about was just um, just the, the idea of seeds and that there are different seeds that need to be sown in different areas. And I feel like that's kind of, there's a different spiritual seed for every kind of situation that might come up, whether it is like one to grieve, there is a seed for that, right? There is a seed for celebration. There is a seed for, and, and so I think that this genre provides so many seeds um, that we can sow in our lives and that we can see gloriously come to fruit. And so I, I, I just really believe that like it, it is, it's, it's really complex. It is really worth study. It is really worth um, us to continue to do this. And I'm, I'm just incredibly grateful for both Sonia and Dion and your, your artistry in this um, because I mean, it is cultural anthropology is what this is. Um, and it's, uh, it needs to be heard. Thank you so much. Can I just say it's it's amazing to hear that attributed to me, cultural anthropology. I just want to make it clear that I just it's a, it's coming from a like a it's a feeling. I don't I'm not even thinking about I'm not even thinking about the the information or the 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 scar the scholarly um, perspective. I'm not thinking about how um how this will benefit me when i tell you um after um uh george floyd was murdered um the desire to to pull myself out of the darkness that i was feeling i was able to pull from and this is my word for from for life is resilience the resilience that our people had, that's what got me out of it. Just this, the resilience. So I just wanted to, to say that because it, it, it's a word that has been with me um, at least since June. And I've just been like keeping it close to me, keeping keeping this music close to me and keeping um, the journey and, and like really what, the highs and the lows, because like you said, Ariane, it wasn't, you know, it was a horrible time, but they still managed to find joy. And all of the accomplishments made with so many barriers. I'm, 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 I don't know how to, I don't know how to articulate how grateful I am to be a black person. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, 
this quote is attributed to St. Augustine. I don't know how accurate it is or not, but, uh, but St. Augustine was, was supposed to have said that when you sing, you pray twice. And, and so, um, and, and St. Augustine uh, allegedly was, was black. Um, as, as one of the early, as, as one of the early leaders of the Catholic Church. Now that could just be legend, you know, but I do believe that to be true. And so, and so, yes, there is an academic um, piece to, to, to this work, but also um, sometimes you just need the songs for the sake of the songs because, because music fills in the places where we don't have words, right? So, so, um, so the moan, right, in, 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 in the Black sacred music tradition, the moan is not filler, right? It is, it is that sound when there are no words for what you are feeling. And if, I don't, I don't think anybody could accurately at all um, speak about what could possibly have been running through George Floyd's mind when he called for his mother as one of the last few words that he had. Or Elijah McClain, um, a, a young man, so sensitive, art and life were intertwined for him when his life was taken from him because, because law enforcement did not know how to respond to, to him and, and how he presented himself, how outside of what he was supposed to be was, like what emotions, what words can we put to those emotions? And so sometimes the songs are not about um, a, a filling a fulfilling a formula. If X, then then Y, right? Sometimes the songs are just the songs, and the songs are 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 what speaks for everything. Um, That's great. So thank you so much again for all of your voices and all of your songs for bring, offering that twice prayer out into the world. Um, I. We went way over time. I'm so sorry about that. But uh, just again, uh, for those watching, Spiritual Uprising is streaming from April 2nd to May 2nd. So I hope whether you're watching this conversation before or after that you enjoy the presentation, but also uh, with Zanya's prompting, go back and just look and read and learn and know and listen and experience the prayer that's being offered. So with that, thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you. So. Thank you, Gina. Thank, Thank you, you. People's Light.